Welcome to Emmanuel Church Glenhaven Bible Talks. Our church is committed to growing together in Christ. And one way we grow in Christ is by His Word as we learn from the Bible. Our prayer is that through these sermons, you will grow in your love for Jesus and trust Him more. This week we paused our Christmas lead-up series to reflect on the importance of ministry with children and young people. In our services today we heard from people who trained at the Anglican Church's Youth Works College and people who work with CREW. CREW is a Bible-based interdenominational Christian organisation which runs camps and other ministries for children and young people. We also heard from people at Emmanuel Church who teach scripture in schools and others who serve in our home-based kids and youth ministries. Our Senior Assistant Minister, Paul Gachins, is a graduate of YouthWorks College. Today he shows us how the good news about Jesus transforms people and brings them into a new community, a family, that embraces all kinds of people of all ages. But before we hear from Paul, let's listen to the Bible. The reading is Acts chapter 16, verses 11 to 15. From Troas we put out to sea, and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day we went on to Neapolis. From there we travelled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who'd gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptised, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now, here's Paul. Father, thank you that you have brought us here in community uh, as family. And we pray this morning that your Holy Spirit might speak to us, that you might help us understand your word so that we may be encouraged, but also that we may be on the lookout for others and the way that we include them. Uh, We thank you for your grace to us at joining us together and pray that again, uh, you will encourage us in your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, As she finished high school, my wife Zoe did a gap year. She's there now. Uh, You can speak to her about this afterwards. Uh, I thought it was, I didn't know her then, but looking back, I think it was a little bit crazy because you you finished school and what did Zoe do? She went back to school for a year. Uh, why would you do that? Well, the reason is, is because she went with an organisation called Rotary and she went to school in Switzerland. <laughs> so, you know, that makes a bit more sense. But one of the things that fascinated about, uh, as Zoe shared with her experience of being overseas for a year away from her family, was the families that she spent time with. Uh, she called them her host families. They, they essentially hosted her in their households. And she often referred to them as her host brother or her host sister, uh, her host dad, her host mum. And I thought it was was quite strange language. And I didn't really understand it until we got married and then later on we managed to spend Christmas with one of her families overseas. And I truly understood what it was to be welcomed as a member of that family. Uh, It was at Christmas time and I have fond memories of singing Christmas carols, uh, or I think they were Christmas carols because they were all in German, but they actually had lit candles on 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 the Christmas tree. Can you imagine that, Wardens, if we did that? It was like fire hazard. Uh, But it was beautiful and there was this sense that their family was my family. I, I came to understand, just like Zoe did, that that this was a mum, this was a dad to me. I wonder if you've experienced such a a sense of warmth and inclusion. 
Uh, it may be something you, you've had at a particular time of life when you, were, uh, you had such a sense of belonging to a group of friends or even just fleeting moments in your life where, where you felt safe. I hope that we know such a depth of relationship, but I also suspect that it's not common enough. That often we do struggle with inclusion, whether it's social cohesion or emotional safety. And many of us are hurt when that's not provided by others around us. Now, today, as we've already heard, we're considering the place of children and young people amongst us and our community. And, and more than any anyone, young people are trying to work out their place. Where, where do they belong in their families or in their schools or, or in churches, perhaps? And particularly, where do they belong in their faith? And it's no doubt, I imagine if we shared stories amongst us, that, amongst us, that many people become Christians uh, before the age of 18. But much has been written on the breakdown of community and family in recent decades, and more currently the effects of COVID on relationships and, and the changes in how we do and are able to relate to one another and particularly for young people, the pressures of social media and finding acceptance and layered on top of this is that fear of rejection that we, we all know what it feels like, but it seems to be exaggerated in this day and age. But, so where does the gospel intersect? I want to suggest that the gospel provides an alternate view of reality, that, that it holds out a picture of belonging and security and community in such a way that it's unrivaled in this world because we're invited to be part of the family of God. Matt Chandler sums it up with this phrase, Jesus takes strangers and makes them a family. It's an invitation for us held out to come and know the goodness of God as a father, to be welcomed as a brother and sister into his family now, I know we often talk about this, it's kind of a conceptual idea, yeah, yeah I'm part of God's family. Uh, but often our experience of church or the Christian community is, is sometimes a little clumsier than that. And, and at worst, at worst, it, it doesn't really reflect the inclusivity and love of Jesus at all. However, it's what God has called us into. It's the model that He's given us to be His people in this world, to reflect something of His love in community as His family. So let's come now to Acts 16, where we find the early formation of the church at Philippi. Now it's the middle of the first century, uh, the disciples and others are spreading the Word of God to various regions and Paul, as his practice, comes into this community and begins to, to plant churches and uh, attend synagogue and such, such things. But when it comes to Philippi, there's no synagogue, there's no church. And he'll write later a letter to this Philippian church that begins on this day. There's so much to glean from this passage, but I, I think there's two things that I find most fascinating. Uh, firstly, the diversity of who hears and responds to the gospel. Uh, who actually attends this, this kind of first church, if you will. But secondly, how more than once, it's the whole household that comes to faith. The first group of people who respond to the message of Jesus are Lydia, which we read, and it's her whole household. And we read that Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth, she was a worshipper of God, that's what we know about her. So she had some connection to the Jewish community, uh, perhaps she believed that there was one creator God, but more particularly, it's pointed out that she was someone of social and economic standing. A purple cloth was, was not just scraps, but it represented wealth. Purple clothes were for the rich and the royal. Lydia hears about Jesus. Lydia responds to Jesus. And it says here in verse 14 and 15 of Acts 16, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. And when she and members of her household were baptised, she invited us to her home. Now imagine if we did share stories of how we became Christians 
in our congregation today, we'd, we'd hear lots of different stories. Uh, it's like when couples are asked, how did you meet? Uh, I was at Isaac and Josie's wedding last Saturday, as a number of you were, and a couple of times I was asked, how did I meet Zoe? Uh, as an aside, if you haven't heard the story of how Michael and Anne met, uh, <laughs> it's worth asking them over morning tea, it's a bit of fun. But so much more important is this question. How did you meet Jesus? And we should share these stories with each other because they remind us of the goodness of God, but also how God works in all circumstances through all different people. For Lydia, she was ready to hear about Jesus and Jesus opened her heart. But more than that, Within one verse, we don't know how much time had passed here, but her whole household is baptised. In the first century, the household wasn't just husband and wife and and a couple of kids like like the Simpsons. It was a bit more like mum, dad, there's cousins, there's grandparents, there's everyone. In fact, in the first century, there's probably servants and servants' families, the extended view of what we see as a household. And so here we have Lydia's heart open, but the gospel takes root uh, across her whole circle. But it's not the only time this happens in Philippi. Now, if you read the next section of Acts 16, Paul and Silas, this is the summary, Paul and Silas continue to share the message. They then get embroiled in some controversy because they uh, release a young slave girl from a demonic spirit And that causes a whole lot of uproar. In fact, they get thrown into prison. They get tortured in prison. And then in the middle of the night, there's an earthquake and the doors are flung open and the jailer's about to kill himself because of what's happened. It's super dramatic. But what's the most dramatic thing that happens? The jailer hears about Jesus from Paul and Silas and becomes a Christian. This Roman who's put in charge of torture an imprisonment. But not only that, let's read in Acts chapter 16, verse 31 to 34. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household, Paul and Silas say. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptised The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. You see the emphasis? It's not just him. Now, I want you to imagine the first Christmas at Philippi. Here's a wealthy, God-fearing businesswoman and her whole household together with a Roman jailer, hopefully a former torturer by then, and his whole household. And throw in potentially the young slave girl who can't make money for her owners because she's no longer controlled by that spirit. Maybe she was included too. What kind of place is this? What kind of church is this? Well, the gospel crosses all social boundaries and It crosses economic boundaries and religious and racial and and every boundary. When Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, he uses the very same term, household, to describe God's family. It says this in Ephesians 2.19, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His household. God takes strangers and makes them into family. Now, together, we are the children of God. And the New Testament constantly reminds us of our brotherhood, our sisterhood. We are a household, a family under God. And it's not just a conceptual approach saying, well, you know, under God, we're all equal, although that's true. But it's here, it's lived as a testament to the power of the gospel. And in case you think it's just a New Testament 
thing or, or something that just happens in Acts when the early church is formed. No, God has always been about bringing people together under His name. Even the formation of Israel in the Old Testament, as the promise was given to Abraham, it says, all people on earth will be blessed through you. And later Israel was to serve as a light to the nations. And God says to them in Isaiah, nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. It's the work of God of drawing people together, Jew and Gentile, male and female, child and adult. The story of Ruth is one of the most beautiful examples of God drawing people to himself and to others. Because here, it's not just a concept. Two women had lost everything, land, children, husbands, and they're brought together when all seems lost. And God forms this family that will one day lead to the family of Jesus himself. When Jesus comes, we see the same heart of God and he includes others in the same way. Jesus sits and eats with those on the fringes of society. He was accused, why why does he sit with tax collectors and sinners? And his answer here in Mark chapter 2, because it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. The good news of Jesus changes people. It brings them into relationship with God and they recognise their own sickness and their need for grace and love and care. But it also transforms then their relationships with each other for the gospel brings people together in a beautiful way that nothing else will. Coming back to Acts, this is what we see. Now, on a human level, did did Lydia really need Jesus? Her business was going well. She had an awareness of God. And it's easy to think of people around us in the hills, well, they've they've got everything. Are they really going to respond to Jesus? And yet at the right time, God opened Lydia's heart. So so she realised, yeah, she did need Jesus. She was one of the sick who needed a doctor. And likewise, the jailer, he had a steady job. He had a whole household. And yet God opened his heart and transform the lives of all the people around him. He realised he needed Jesus. And so they form a new family, a new community that would have stood out and would have spread. Now today we're considering youth and children particularly, and we've heard from a number of people of their experience, And we're praying a little bit later in the service for the work of YouthWorks and Crew in particular. Uh, They're both organisations that that are intentional about reaching children and young people with the gospel. Uh, They help train people for church ministry, but they also reach out in various uh, ways, especially through camping ministry, to young people. Uh, Now, I cover a lot of bases here because I both went to YouthWorks College Uh, but I also used to work for crew, like a number of people in our congregation. Now, I could share many stories, but one thing I've learnt that is still true today is the word opportunity. Friends, we've we've got so many opportunities uh, in, in our country, and particularly in New South Wales through SRE, where hundreds of young people every day on camp and in school lunchtime groups, in youth programs and events, get to hear about Jesus. Now, each of us here might not have that personal reach, but I think today we can pray and support those who do. And my prayer is, I think, is the same as Paul and Silas would have prayed for Lydia, that the Lord would open her heart, that the Lord would open their hearts, to hear and respond to the message of Jesus. But I also want to suggest that the opportunities for the gospel start with us here, 
in our church community. Uh, as I said, we, we don't know if that slave girl got kicked out of her household at that point in time. But I'd like to think that Paul and Lydia and the jailer had a ready-made family for her. So what's the place of children and young people in this church? Well, I hope and pray that they will always be loved, that they will be cared for, that they will be prioritised and that they'll be known by name. One of the values of this church I love uh, is that where every person is known and loved. Uh, I think it's going to be on a, a banner soon out the front of our church, where every person is known and loved. They will know not just each other's names, but we will know them. That we won't just know them, but that they will be loved and feel loved. But also, they'll be, known, they'll be reminded that they're known and loved by God. So how do we do that? Well, for young people, it's how we speak about them. It's the, the unwritten or unspoken ways of how we use our space and what we celebrate how we value them in their service, whether we see them helping out or being a part of things. Whether it's cheering them on at the Christmas nativity that's coming up and celebrating with them like we had a recent wedding and when we celebrated uh, Caitlin's baptism a couple of weeks ago where lots and lots of people came in the evening service uh, and prayed and cheered and celebrated with her. And our prayer is that many more will hear about Jesus, that their hearts will be open to Him, that they'll be included in the community of faith in such a way that they're reminded of how much God has included them in His household, in in His family, because that's what He's done for each of us. So let's pray this morning that we'll be reminded of this both in our lives and in the lives of children and young people in our midst. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for the power of the gospel. We thank you that it draws people from all backgrounds and all ages and all nations. And we look forward to that day as celebrated in the book of Revelation, that people will gather at the name of Jesus from all nations, tribes, languages. And so we look forward to that, but we pray that we will do our best to be an expression of that community and that love in this place today, both in our children's and young people, but also with every person, that they will indeed be known and loved by us as they're known and loved by you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you for listening today. We pray that God will use what you've heard to help you grow in Christ. For more information about Emmanuel Church Glenhaven, please visit our website, glenhaven.church. We look forward to your company next time. Bye.